it is my absolute honor to present Professor Regine Lejeune from the University of uh, Paris en Pantin Sorbonne. Uh, Professor Lejeune is an expert in the social history of early medieval Europe. Her research has contributed greatly to the study of social ties, especially in the Frankish kingdoms of the 6th to 10th centuries. Professor Lejeune's work has, fo has focused on relationships of kin, friendship, marriage, fidelity, and dependence, and the way their development shaped and affected the structures of power and kinship at large. Among other awards and honors, she is a recipient of the Prix Gobert, uh, Chevalier de Palme Académique, and a corresponding member of the Royal Historical Society and the National Society of Antiquaries of France. Professor Lejean is the director of the uh, Brepols Press Au Moyen Age book series. And together with Wim Blockmans, she is the general editor of Routledge Medieval Encyclopedia Online. Uh, Professor Lejean's many publications include Famille et Pouvoir dans le Monde Franc, Femme, Pouvoir et Société dans le Haut Moyen Âge, Histoire de la France, Origine et Premier Essor, Les Mérovingiens, and at the heart of our lecture today, her forthcoming book, L'Amitié et la Haine au Haut Moyen Âge. Today, Professor Lejean will talk about friendship and hate in the early Middle Ages, relationality and identities. As usual, we will take questions at the end of the lecture. And now, uh, without further ado, Professor Lejean, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to my question on uh, friendship and hatred in the early Middle Ages. Um, as the topic is uh, too vast, I have chosen only a few aspects, leaving aside uh, all that concerns uh, rituals, practices, and also the difficult question of uh, carnal spiritual friendship, which would have led too far. Slide, slide two. Um, contrary forces clash in the world, joy and trust, are opposed to fear and jealousy, love to hate. We see how the, is the second one. So, yes. Uh, you see how the Anglo-Norman monk, Orderic Vital, describes the society of his time at the beginning of the 12th century. In fact, it was not the reality of the feudal society because his vision was largely timeless or rather uh, it was set in an eschatological uh, perspective. Love and hate are universal feelings or emotion, but in the early Middle Ages and in the Middle Ages in general, they were used by clerics through a moralizing prism to qualify some forms of behavior, association, or action as being privacy or condemnable, good or bad. So it's necessary not to take for realities what often belong to the discourse, while knowing that discourse or imaginary well, uh, is itself a form of reality or a part of the real. Slide three. Next. Uh, Orderic Vital was talking about love and hate, not friendship and hate. The first point to note is that our distinction between love and friendship doesn't work or not completely for the early Middle Ages. Lexicographical analysis shows that words such as amicitia, amicitia, dilexio, amor, affectus, caritas, were used do, to designate both friendship and love relationship. In fact, 
our distinction between love and friendship come, comes from uh, sexualized, sexualized representation dating from the 19th century. Next. Next. In a letter uh, written at the end of the 10th century uh, by Gerbert of Aurillac on behalf of Arnaud, Archbishop of Reims, to his colleague Egbert of Trier, Gerbert used the words caritas, dilexio, amicitia, and societas in an interchangeable way. All had an affective connotation that was no less for very holy friendship, Sanctissima Amicitia, uh, than for mutual affection, mutua dilection. You see benevolential, abundantia, caritate, mutua dilectione, Sanctissima Amicitia, firma societas. Next. Friendship, love, and hatred are emotion. The history of emotion has been analyzed in the works of Barbara Runenwein, Ricardo Cristani, exploring the emotional life in the past, emotional experience. But affectivity is always uh, experienced inside a symbolic order clearly identified identifiable by actors, by its, but itself changing. Certainly we must avoid against any evolutionary temptation. Medieval people were no less in control of their emotion than Westerners in the 21st century, but they expressed them differently according to their own codes. The social expression, expression and the moral evaluation of friendship and hatred tell us a lot about medieval societies, as Stephanie Yeager has demonstrated for love in the Central Middle Ages and Daniel Smale for hatred in the late Middle Ages. In my book, I considered this emotion from a relational point of view as affective and emotional relationship. Next. How to perceive the emotional nature of relationship and the personal subjectivity at that time? In the written sources, medieval sources, medieval people rarely express themselves in the first person. Autobiographies or texts directly expressing the feelings of the author or his reaction to emotion were not very frequent. There is no equivalent of the confession of St. Augustine in the fourth century. The ninth century certainly marks the caesura. A few texts such, such as Duoda's Manual for My Son the Confession of the Monk Gottschalk of Orbe, later the history of our Glaber at the beginning of the 11th century, uh, or the autobiography of Guibert de Donjon at the beginning of the 12th century are among the rare preserved texts of this type. Next. Letters are important sources and some of them are true friendship letter addressed to a specific person qualified as a friend, amicus, or a beloved, delectus, carus, amatus. That kind of writing uh, was very common in late antiquity, and it reappears in the, the eighth century, uh, first in Anglo-Saxon, uh, than with Carolingian White, scholars of White. The question is, does this letter reflect the feelings of their writers, the emotional nature of the relationship? Authors often follow epistolary models, but 
the choice of affective terms such as carissimus, carissima, delectissimus, delectissima, could express real feelings. Two letters collected uh, in the Octavian epistles, late 6th, early 7th century, seem to me particularly significant. The first one was written around uh, 580s by Duke Dinamius, one correspondent of the Italian poet uh, Venantius Fortunatus, to a friend, poet Fortunatus himself, to urge him to write to him. He says that he remembers the sweet promises of his affection, affectionist, and never ceases to show the desires of his heart by his six. The other one is from Gogo, tutor of the king of Austrasia, to his patron, Duke Caming, who has shown him the sweet affection, Dulce Dinis Affectus, with which he is hurt with five. The fruit of an ancient caritas, which unites them by indivisible bonds of French election. That's the letter. Uh, acts of donation have uh, preambles also written in the first person, exposing the personal motivations of the donor, but scribes and notaries also followed formularies. Funerary inscriptions are no exception to the rule, for even if they, exp if they expressed feelings about the dead, there is no evidence that these feelings are, were always real. In fact, none of these texts was completely private in the modern sense, since they were all intended for a public that was obviously much larger than the recipient. Even a work such as the manual that Joda wrote in the early 840s for son William was certainly intended for the court and for King Charles the Bold himself. And her text also served the interest of Bernard of Septimania, her husband, and William father, as much as it expressed the feeling of Joda. Should we conclude, as often uh, been done, that early medieval people did not express themselves sincerely? There is no univocal answer. Charters, however coded they may have been, are rich in personal information if we place in their context of writing and some letters really do compensate for the absence of a beloved one, such as the letter that Charlemagne addressed to his wife Fastrada in 791. In the same way, if Duda followed a model of the good Christian mother, giving uh, uh, her son a moral education, a rule of conduct and of Christian life, it is difficult to doubt her maternal love expressed at the end of her manual, her pain of being separated from her son, nor the hope of seeing them again one day. Medieval authors followed the rules, the social and literary conventions, and the ideological representations of their time. In the context of the lingui linguistic turn and after the book of Philip Buck, historians have gradually become aware that they have first or only access to a discursive reality, but the importance of the text has always also been underlined because it is itself inserted in the human experience and part of the human agency. Next. 
Uh, the Life of Charlemagne, written by Einart, offer, uh, offers a good example because it provides valuable information about the feelings of the great emperor. In the fa famous chapter on the private and intimate life of Charles, Einart uses a rich palette of emotions. He writes that the death of his son Pippin, a 10 and Charles a 11 caused him great sorrow, which was expressed publicly by abundant weeping that the emperor could not repress. Quote, so extraordinary was his paternal law that he could not help but burst into tears, quote, wrote Einart, who headed, quote, in the same way when he, when he was told of the death of the Roman pontiff Hadrian, his favorite friend, he wept as he had, as if he had lost a brother or a beloved son. But we have no reason to doubt Charlemagne's grief at the death of his sons and his friend Hadrian, as Louis Alfred did in 1938. Charles the Younger, elder son of Charlemagne from his wife Hildegard, had always lived with him and had been designated by him as his principal heir in 86. Charlemagne loved his son Pippin, whose widow and daughters he took into his court after his death in 910. His friendship with Pope Hadrian was also attested by exchange of letters and by the canonical collection given by the Pope to Charlemagne. Did Charlemagne really cry when he heard that he stripped his sons uh, and his friend had, had died? Probably. Uh, firstly, by shedding tears, Charles was complying with Frankish codes. When a beloved one died, it was normal to shed tears publicly. By we weeping for his sons and his friend, uh, like everyone else, Charles identified himself with the collective value of the Frankish elite, which he never, he never ceased to do, as confirmed by the past passage in the same chapter where Einart emphasized that the emperor always wore the national costume of the Franks, disdaining that of other nations, or that he used to bath in his swimming pool with his sons, but also with his guards, more than, than 100 people. Charles' emotions were used to reinforce the consensus between the Carolingian king and the elites. The ruler described by Ena was close to his own. He loved his relatives and friends and did not allow himself to be carried away by anger or hatred. The life offered his readers and listeners a model of family harmony as Dinty Nelson showed. Finally, the question of whether the emotion displayed in the story of the past were real or feigned, or whether they expressed the truth of ego is of little importance because such emotion express forms of sensitivity accepted by society. Next, to go further into medieval society and to understand medieval relationships, Western historians must set aside their modern conception of the person. Choosing a new perspective, that of relationality rather than of individuality. The individual as a person who is indivisible, conscious of, of, of his self, of his limits, autonomous is a modern concept. To qualify the person in ancient or other societies, 
British anthropologists like Marilyn Strathern and Janet Carstern, or Brazilian Eduardo Viveros de Castro, or French uh, like uh, Philippe Descola, have used the concept of relationality and of relational person. A relational person is formed by and through his, his or her relation with other beings. This relation creates its different constitutive entities and identity. While an, an individual is unique, limited, not divisible person, a relational person is a being, being in relation, not limited if not limitless. In each of his relations or identities, he seems to exist only throughout this identity disregarding all other social contexts, assuming a particular quote, role in the literal sense of the ancient persona with a room for manner more important as is male and of high rank. This is how the Deregis persona by Ingmar of Wims could be understood the royal person was a king playing his role as king, and the image he gave was that of a complete person. Marshall Salins and Philip Descola also specified that a relational person has parts of itself distributed in a vital way in other beings which were recipro reciprocally co-present and interdependent. The idea of the participation of being in others as a condition of their existence is to be found in Plato and Aristotle and is at the core of the medieval conception of the person. By choosing the perspective of relationality and of relational persons divisible into as many identities or relationships, we can understood behaviors that sometimes seem to come under the heading of hypocrisy or naivety. What we qualify as naivety or duplicity was a matter of plural identities and transformation that could be justified by other identities or higher interests. To return to the topic, the figure of the frame was value and that of the traitor was hated, as well as trust and mistrust. But the frequent reversals also show that these relations were less opposed than it seems. The value of each affect relationship identity depended on virtue, a concept that was itself highly polysemic and introduce both moral and gender differentiation and hierarchy. Next. The ethics of antique friendship was ba based on reciprocity and male virtue of courage and moral surpassing. As a member of the ruling class, Cicero, the author, of the De Amicitia made a difference between good and bad friendship. The first one was a friendship from the heart, a friendship between, between equals. The second, one was, the second one was an interested friendship, a dissymmetrical friendship between a patron and his client. That distinction distinction between good and bad, true and false friendship, between good and bad friendship passed over century and had constantly taken up but by medieval authors. But it has also been transformed by social and cultural changes. The old distinctions were replaced by others based, for example, on the sincerity 
or falsity of friendship. On the introduction of an oath for sworn friendship, on the collective nature of friendship, or on the opposition between spirit and flesh, which, le which led to identify false friendship with hate. Roman values have been quickly confronted with Christian universalism, especially with God's love for all his children. Nevertheless, there was, there was no clash of cultures, no confrontation of contrary values. Virtue, the Latin virtus, uh, remains the social cement, cement of friendship. Virtuous friendship continue to be a viril, virilis friendship, that is courageous, demanding and tending towards the good, therefore male, but the good was now thought in relation not to the city, but to God, which made it possible to integrate clerics and also women and to move the gender boundary. From the Carolingian period, at least, God love, God's love became an ideal reference for all kinds of friendship, but without any practical effectiveness, if not uh, embodied. Next. As a distinct, distinctive value for elites, friendship, came from familiarity, a very essential notion. And it was recognized by benevolentia, that is the expected material or immaterial benefits of affection. In the early Middle Ages, there is no friendship without benefits. Friendship developed in spaces of socialization, like families, courts, monastic school, warlike companies. Young men were often attracted by intellectual proximity, common practices, a same teacher or a same lord. Common interests could also lead to create bounds of friendship by a marriage, a, peg, a pact or an oath. Finally, Friendship could also transcend, transcend, transcend hierarchy of age, status, or gender, and could also be collective by irrigating community. The importance of intercessions has, has been demonstrated by Sun Gildorf in his book, The Favor of Friends, Intercession and Aristocratic Politics, in Carolingian in, and Autonian Europe, 2014. Here you see the representation of Count Widow, uh, it's a bio tapestry, uh, and you see the representation of Count Widow leading Duke Harold to William, Duke of Normandy. After Widow met uh, Harold at the it at uh, his arrival on the continent. And after he announced this arrival to William through his envoys, widow was an intercessor. Then William and Harold make, made a pact of friendship. Intercession and sworn pact testify that is, it is not possible to oppose a sincere personal affection to an interested friendship, because all kinds of friendships were engagements and could be mobilized at any time. Next, it is not possible either to oppose kinship and friendship. Let antique friendships were largely inherited. They gave force to family relationships and network that foreshadow the early medieval family groups. There is no evidence that Christianization 
led to a process of spiritualization of kinship that somehow would have dissolved the ties of consanguinity, affinity, or adoption into a broad spiritual kinship or friendship. Bonds, bonds of kinship must be embodied to be efficient, including the bonds of godparenthood, which was subject to the same marriage prohibitions as the bonds of consanguinity and affinity or any other form of adoptive kinship. The only disembodied kinship or friendship was the one that united all the baptism to God or to each other. But this one remained ineffective unless other ties gave it form. As Sigebert de Jean Blou wrote, and you see on the slide, as Sigebert de Jean Blou wrote in the second half of the 10th century, taking up a, stat a statement of Aristotle, kinship without friendship was only an empty shell. And also pre-existing patriarchal models have also been Christianized with an ever stronger insistence on paternity and hierarchy. And by analogy, all hierarchical bonds tended to be derived from God's authority and to a fides which in force for some, some people could be a form of clientelist friendship. Friendship therefore continue to outline the the contours of groups of dominance, lay and ecclesiastical, transcending hierarchies, and to give form and efficiency to all personal relationships, activating, activating the, legal bond, the legal bonds of kinship or fidelity, and also creating new relationships outside any legal framework. Next. But early medieval societies were also warrior and honor societies. And the rule of violence, vengeance, and predation cannot be ignored. So their importance must be questioned in relation to the ideology of love and the search for friendship. War violence War was indeed constitutive of male identity and justify, legitimate, if it was maintained at an acceptable level, varying according to region and times. In any case, violence and predation went together, and it's important to note that emotion and wealth were circulating together by giving to friend or to God and taking from enemies or dependents. External conquest, justified by the conversion of pagans or the defense of the kingdom of God, were also motivated by the lure of wealth and power and the will of weaken enemies by destroying their properties. In the early medieval societies, external wars never prevented internal violence, predation, or revenges in the form of fires, devastation, and pillaging that, that were, were ordinary means of pressure to force rival and enemies to negotiate and accept a new balance of power. Charlemagne and Louis the Pious have legislated to limit, quote, private violence, obliging free peasants to lay down their arms when returning from military campaigns, forbidding armored pursuit, revenge, and murder imposing recourse to public courts and 
enjoining royal advents to judge, to judge according to the law, without allowing themselves to be corrupted and without taking into account the, tie, the ties of friendship and kinship. But at the same time, Carolingian rulers were also predatory rulers. Pippin the Short and Charlemagne have devastated Aquitania year after year. Ingmar of Wims wrote that, that King Charles the Bold and his armies has been plundering, burning, and ravaging the church land of Wims on his way back of, from a failed meeting with his nephew, Lothar II. Because armies had no provisions, tradition was an accepted way of interaction in case of hostility, even between kings and parents inside the Carolingian kingdom. Violence and predation are related to the question of hatred and vengeance. Vengeance was both a reality and a part of the medieval imaginary, as the song of Raoul of Combray testifies. But hatred was therefore royally blind, except in time of great stress and of social and political crisis. As we know, hatred was negotiated like kingship, like friendship, excuse me, and it could frequent, frequently be converted into love or friendship. But Fredegar in the seventh century wrote a very interesting sentence when he talked about the aggressive competition between two Burgundian magnates, Villebald, a powerful patrice of Burgundy, and the Duke Flaucad, a duke in Burgundy. They, they had sworn many friendship in churches, but according to Fredegar, hatred was remain, quote, hidden in the death of hurts for as long as necessary while establishing or re-establishing friendship. Fredegar didn't qualify this friendship or as false or bad friendship. He said that friendship haven't never completely removed the hate, the hatred. During, during all that time, they have been cooperators and competitors and their friendship remain fragile because probably without any real affection. When the Duke Flaucad became mayor of the palace of Burgundy, thanks to the queen Nantildis in 641, equilibrium balance was really broken. Flaucad searched to kill Villebald. Finally, Villebald was killed by Flaucad who also died struck by God's judgment, according to Fredegar. Here we can see the multiple identities and the diverse role played by, by Villebald and Flaucald and the diverse emotion. Equilibrium could be easily broken in periods of political crisis. The brutal outbreak of murders at the turns of the 9th century and 10th century was a consequence of a political crisis in the Carolingian kingdoms. After that, new balances were established, have been established in the first feudal age. Probably competition became more aggressive and uncertain for the control of public offices, of castles, of monasteries, abbesses. 
Dominique Barthélémy qualified this form of conflictual interaction as fatal wars, wars of vengeance, turning on them, themselves without precise cause, cause, except the desire of weaken, to weaken the adversary by destroying his property. I think it's quite reductive to qualify these kinds of interaction as vengeance, even if cases of revenge really exist. Written sources use binary opposition, such as courage, fear, justice, injustice, law, hatred. But these interactions were part of more or less aggressive multi-level competition involving large networks and states. In fact, such exchanges of values cannot be separated from the global circulation of affects and wealth, as heritage, the Latin hereditas, was constitutive of the personal status, status of the person. Affective relationships were inseparable from patrimony transfers and from giving and taking to and from all sorts of persons and institutions into a global circulation of affect and goods involving even and earth, the living and the dead. Next. Donations to co anima have begun, began, begun in the fourth century and continue, continued in the early Middle Ages, determine, determining what Jan Wood has just called a temple society, a society organized in, to provide for the needs of the churches and of a caste of priests who took charge of the redistribution to the poor. The central phenomenon has certainly been the development of monastic communities, then of association sworn or not, which were considered as communities of brothers and confrères on the model of the apostle. All these communities were, were, were closely integrated into the social fabric through their extra community links with their lay benefactors designated as their friend. Next. That gigantic transfer of wealth led to integrate lay donators, benefactors into monastic fraternities from the 8th to the 11th century through bonds of friendship. For example, Count Gerold, brother-in-law of Charlemagne, gave the Abbey of Reichenau a golden, a golden altar to be buried inside the church. Some benefactors have also been inscribed, written, as friends of the monks or nuns into the Libri Memoriales, such as those of Reichenau, Saint Gall, Pepers, uh, uh, here you see uh, the Liber Vivensium uh, of Pepers, and you see the inscription of Pipinus Rex, Carolus Imperator, Ludovicus Imperator, Pipinus Rex, and uh, Ildegardus Regina, Iudgarda Regina, Judith Regina Ita. But also uh, Rotardus Laicus, Varinus Laicus, Isambardus Laicus, Umfredus Laicus, Adalbertus Laicus, Ludo Laicus, Ludfredus Laicus. Uh, which were which were uh, important magnets in Retia uh, in the ninth century. Uh, next, 
And here you see uh, two pages of the Liber Confraternitatum of Reichenau. Uh, the page is 98 and 99. Uh, with the uh, uh, nomina amicorum vivensium, that is uh, the name of uh, the uh, friends, uh, the living li living friends of the monks we we were uh, writing, listing uh, on these pages. Uh, the most famous benefactor who were also the most important uh, political actors, have multiplied and intertwined their relationships with monastic communities and became part of the vast confraternities uh, developing from the end of the, of the uh, 8th century and supporting the Carolingian Empire. The extent of this phenomena reflects the strong interconnection between the spiritual and the temporal, the religious and the political spheres. The large confraternities of prayers must give an ideological frame to integrate Christian people and to diffuse the ideas that generalized Christian friendship centered on monasteries, went together with the fidelity to the king. On a more regional scale, abbots and abbesses had influence and control over their local networks of friends and dependents. As for example, the abbess of Avenay in the diocese of Rims, at the time of Bertha, daughter of Emperor, Emperor Lothar and Empress, Emperor, Empress Hermongard in the year 840 to uh, 854. Or the abbess of Origny in the diocese of Flans at the time of Prince Herman and Richild acting, acting as rectrices of the abbey, of the nunneries. Abbots and abbesses were interacting with kings, with towns and bishops, who were sometimes their friends, sometimes their rivals or both. They could compete and cooperate for the control of the local network of friends. In the second half of the 9th century, competition for lay abbesses between magnates has developed not only to get more prestige or a part of monasteries in Kobe, which obviously matters, but also to take control of local networks of benefactors' friends. After that, in the 10th century, when princes renounced to the lay abode, to be lay abode, and pushed to monastic reform, they continued to maintain special friendly relationships with reform communities, while they encouraged their vassals to donate their property or fiefs themselves thus reinforcing the porosity between the different spheres and relations. Conflict between monks and canons and their friends or hair of benefactors have existed in the 8th century at least. Clerics and monks denouncing the enemies of God where we were attacking church property, burning and ravaging as pagans. Generally, such conflicts ended in favor of the monastic community through mediation and compromise, which didn't fail to denounce the enemies of God, God 
opposed to the friends of God. Such discourses of fear became more frequent in the 10th and 11th century in the context of reform of the, the, the peace of God and probably of endemic violence. Next. Let me uh, finish with the story of Walter Castellan, Castellanus, that is the great advocate. advocate. Uh, no, next. Next. Uh, Castellanus, that is here, the great advocate, advocate of the Church of Cambrai for all its property. Its property. Uh, from the beginning of the 11th century to 1041, because it's very interesting for our distinct discussion. In the Gesta Episcoporum Camera Sensium, written for, for the first part in 1024-25 um, for Bishop Girard of Cambrai, uh, and then continue till the 12th century, all the successive castellans of Cambrai from the 10th to the, the end of the 11th century uh, have been the bad guys, the enemies of their Lord bishops and the enemies of God. But Walter, contemporary to Bishop Gérard, was the, was the worst one. According to the Gesta, he had always devastated the church properties, broken his successive facts of friendship with the bishop, violating his oath, so that at a certain point, the bishop was excommunicating his castellan. Normally, excommunication was a temporary sanction before a reconciliation. And Walter has asked for forgiveness, penance to be reintegrated into the community. But Bishop Gérard refused to remove the excommunication. Soon after, Walter was murdered by one of his enemies on the cathedral steps in uh, 1041. And the story goes on. After Walter's death, Bishop Gérard could but wouldn't remove the excommunication. And Walter's widow had to bury her husband on his land, not in a Christian cemetery. She took the lead of revenge in revenge, ravaging revenging, burning church property. Finally, under the pressure of Walter France, that is, the King of France himself, the Counts of Flanders and his wife, the Bishop of Noyon, the Count of Vermandois, and other Greeks, Bishop Gérard must remove, remove Walter's excommunication. It is what the Gesta said of Walter's life and death. In fact, the successive castellans of Cambrai seem, seem to have had bad relationship with the bishop of Cambrai, their lord, their lords. Because if you see the maps, because uh, they are strong interest in the kingdom of France. Cambrai, you see Cambrai in the, on the map, Cambrai here. Uh, Cambrai was a wealthy Lotharingian city located in the empire, but close to the border with the kingdom of France. And the diocese of of Cambrai on the right uh, depended on the province of France in the kingdom. In addition, 
the Bishop of Cambrai, chosen by Emperor, was also Bishop of Arras. Arras was in the kingdom of France and under the control of the powerful Count of Flanders, who was Count of Artois too. Whenever a bishop died, a strong competition developed between different groups in, on both sides of, of the border before the emperor was choosing the new bishop. In 1012, Girard of Turin was chosen by the Emperor Henry II among his Lotharingian faithfuls against other candidates. A parent, a friend, the brother of count, the Count, uh, the Count of Flanders, and also a brother of Walter the Castle. The Castle, the brother seems to have been canon of the Cathedral of Cambrai. On the other side, the castles were vassals of the bishop for their office, but the bishop didn't really have choice the castellan who was who had pro properties to protect and friend in the kingdom and who had inherited their office. Nevertheless, it cannot be it cannot it cannot be said that it was a situation of face-to-face -face hate again love church against lay people. Walter's behavior is not understandable without considering how his poor identities combine in a relational and emotional perspective. He was a Carolensis, that is, from the kingdom of France. By his origin, his properties in the counties of Vermandois, his castle of Florence. Uh, his networks also. From other sources, we also know that he was a friend of a mo the monks of Saint Amand near Valenciennes. Uh, Saint Amand was a powerful monastery, uh, whom he had made important donas donation to be buried inside the cemetery of the monk of Saint Amand, which was only possible after his excommunication was removed. But at the same time, Walter was a Lotharingian too by his office of castellan, inherited from his father by member of his family and friend in the city of Cambrai and in the chapter of Cambrai. Some of his friends could have interceded on his behalf without the guest star mentioned it. Even if Walter had been ravaging church properties when he was in conflict with his Lord Bishop, and only in, that case, in these cases, he was also considered as a benefactor by the monk of Saint Amand, and probably by the canons of Cambrai, to whom he made donations. It probably explains why next, next. It probably explains why he, the he, the bad castellan of the Gesta Episcoporum Camera Sensium, the enemy of the bishop in the Gesta, has not been included in a list of malefactores of the Church of Cambrai occupied at the beginning of the 11th century in a liturgical book, an evangeliary from the beginning, from the end of the 9th century. There is, he is not in the list. Uh, Gérard and the Castellan Walter uh, were not opponent at all time and uh, Walter was not an enemy of the chapter of Cambrai. Both the bishop and 
Walter have concluded many pacts of friendship with oaths and hostages, but they have never been synonymous of benevol with benevolence and remain fragile. Another and last example from the same period, and we can compare, we have no time, but we can compare. Another experience from the same period would be the Convencio Ugonis, a story of uh, the Poitou. But the story was reversed. In the story of the Convencio Ugonis, the vassal, Hugh of Lusignan, uh, always loved his lord, the Count William of Poitiers, Duke of Aquitania, but what wasn't loved by him. The terms amor, amar, are omnipresent in the story in the Convencio, while they were completely absent from the Gesta of Cambrai. According to the Convencio, after a lot of injustices, Hugh was forced to attack his lord until an agreement, a final agreement, was concluded. In reality, we know that Hugh has been supported by, his lord, by the lord, by the duke, on several occasions. And in fact, these kinds of interactions are not in, in the understandable without taking in account the purpose of each text in a much larger relational scale, both vertical and horizontal, and the multiple co-identities and relationships. To conclude, I want to qualify the culture of that time, a culture of love, according to the question, Christian ontology, ideology, or a culture of vengeance and hatred. It's not the good question. The apparent dichotomy between an ideal centered on love and friendship and a real centered on honor and competition was an ideological discourse. These society weren't face-to-face -face societies and hatred wasn't dominant. Of any. Violence was accepted, but hatred had to be converted into friendship because friendship was a social and political ideal for the competing elite, and friendship gave force to kinship and to kinship and to fidelity. At the same time, the possibility of being a friend of monks and an enemy of a bishop of being friend of someone while keeping hatred for him. The little fear of, of sanction, like uh, excommunication, which were so reversible as other relations or emotions, all that for taking account the perspective of multiple and changing identity of relationality. Finally, if you would qualify the culture of the time, it would be a culture of mediation and intercession in a deep interpenetration of both temporal and spiritual spheres. Intercession reinforces the chain of authority while mediation brings peace. And both offered to those who did not bear arms, clearly, monks, nuns, and also women, the opportunity to reinforce the own, their own position in the hierarchy, even if they have never been the only mediators and intercessors. Next. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Lejean. That was fascinating. I have uh, enough questions to talk for another two hours, but uh, I will open the the stage for uh, for the audience's questions. 
so I didn't see if anyone asked me. Uh, okay. Um, if uh, no one takes the opportunity to ask first, then I will. Yes. Um, as, as the mediator, I have these uh, rights. Um, so I, I just to, to kind of begin, um, I'm, I'm wondering, there is a lot of, uh, as you have mentioned yourself, a lot of um, a lot of the Roman culture and a lot of Roman norms of communication and appropriateness of communication in this type of, um, uh, in this, the, the choice of words of in amicitia, in, in all of this. And I wonder to what extent do you, do you think, or can we think of this, the adoption of these um, terms as an attempt to communicate um, Romanitas, right? Or an attempt to communicate um, the Roman order of the world as the appropriate order of the world. Um, I think that there is not a great difference between um, the perspective of Amicitia, the antique Amicitia, and the medieval uh, Amicitia, the medieval friendship. There is difference, but Amicitia remains the, the perspective of the, the, the common perspective of the elite, of the dominant. But the Amicitia were uh, in the, in the letter the antiquity and let and let antiquity amicitia was was turned to the city and in the early medieval society uh, there was no more turn to the city but to god pro progressively to god uh, do you understand what uh, what I say? My English is not very good. Yeah, no, no, of course, of course, of course. Th that also makes, I mean, I think Manu has a question that also relates in a way um, to that. But I think that, that bears the question of Caritas in, it, it, it teases the question of, of the, the, I don't know, the, the job of what kind of uh, role God plays in, in Amikitia now, if Caritas and God are, are agents in this, uh, in this uh, thing. Uh, um, the, um, the, the love of God and uh, what, we, what we called Caritas, but it's not the only, it, it's not the only terms. Uh, we are always uh, talking about Caritas, but Caritas it is only uh, one term and is is not only referred to God's law. There is caritas in Lotharingian text. There is caritas with a car, which is not related uh, with the love of God. Do you understand? So, so it's what I I don't use the term caritas uh, to explain the love of God. Caritas is one term but it was also amor and for sometimes, uh, sometimes amicitia. The terms are quite identical. What, uh, what I see in the text that the term, the term amor is more and more uh, used to qualify the relation of authority. The relation between uh, God and the, the Christian people, but also the relation between the king and his subject, and also in the charters. The term amor uh, appears in the 9th, but 10th and 11th century to qualify the relation of the Lord and his vassals uh, more and more. Uh, in the Western Kingdom, but also in the Lotharingian kingdoms, uh, a little later in the 1170, century, 1170, yes. But it comes also the term amor. And, uh, it's a, uh, it's uh, en gros bon. uh, I don't see. Uh, <laughs> in, 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 uh, <laughs> uh, 
from Robert, no, not English. Uh, so it's what I see. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, I, Manu, do you want to ask your question? Yeah. You're muted. Ah, yes. Now okay. I think. Does that? Yeah. Right. So I have a question about the false friendship which describes the relationship between a patron and a client. That is a relationship between unequals. When in the relationship between God and his saints, who are often considered friends of God, how, how does the Ciceronian um, classification apply? Because there can be no equality between gods and humans, even among those who are considered saints. So it, I, I'm just wondering if there was any sort of commentary um, by any sort of monastic commentaries that might say something about how to understand the relationship between a patron and a client, which is a legitimate relationship. Yeah. Cicero just says you cannot call it amicitia. Well, uh, the differentiation, the Ciceronian differentiation between a good friendship, that is a friendship between equals and bad friendship, that is a disymmetrical friendship because, because it is interested, uh, doesn't work in the, in late antiquity, Augustine was a client of his patron and uh, his friendship with his lord was a good friendship. So the differentiation between uh, the Ciceronian uh, differentiation between good and bad friendship uh, goes further in the Middle Ages, but it changed the perspective. The disymmetrical uh, friendship was not considered considered as a bad friendship in the early medieval, medieval, med Middle Ages. But the false friendship is considered as a bad friendship. Do you understand? But it, it is not a disymmetrical friendship. A false friendship is a, is a, um, uh, it's not a real friendship. It's uh, the practice of friendship without, uh, without, uh, benevol benevolence, yes, or uh, the jest of friendship dissimulating the hate and the desire of killing uh, the other. Do I guess that my, my question is, in do you find relations between unequals described using the term amicitia yes. in late antiquity? They say this is, uh, so I'm asking a very precise term. Are they using the word amicitia to describe a relationship that is clearly between unequals? Yes. Okay, thank you. Next, we have a question from uh, Jeff Kajal. Hi, everyone. Um, you can hear me, so, so, so how? Yes, okay. Uh, if I, if my voice is quavering, it's because it's freezing in San Francisco right now, and I'm too cheap to turn on the heat. So, <laughs> it's, um, Regina, it was wonderful hearing such a a, a, a clear uh, statement of of these really complicated issues. Um, I was struck by something though from the very beginning of your first slide, in which you gave three sources, each of them, if I recall, monastic, and each of which emphasized jealousy. Uh, and yet the emotional terminology that you dealt with did not include jealousy, which is puzzling, well, which is noteworthy. I'm not sure if it's puzzling. Um, it strikes me that already in the rule of St. Benedict, jealousy is, is foregrounded as an evil vice, uh, an evil emotion perhaps, I don't know, but a vice. Um, and one would expect to find jealousy in small group interactions um, such as one finds 
in a monastery. And it's for grounded not just in Orderic and the other and Guibert, but also in um, the life of uh, Bernard of Clairvaux, for example, uh, in many monastic sources. One would expect then to find jealousy in small as, as operative as a, as, a, as a concern in small, close, interacting, hierarchically structured groups uh, where a lot depends upon closeness, familiaritas with the boss, the abbot in this case. It's therefore not surprising that one finds it in Chrétien de Troyes and Marie de France as a, a, a motivator. But it is interesting that you don't you, you find it in the guest of Hamburg of the Archbishops of Hamburg Bremen very briefly, but in other you, I wouldn't expect it in like tenth and early eleventh century political sources like uh, the the the, the Conventum of Human Chile Art. I wouldn't expect it in Richet or Clodoar. I would expect it in Nithard. I would expect it in Carolingian sources, in other words, which are very court oriented and in which one would find the same kinds of dynamics of struggle and competition for familiaritas and benevolentia. But my recollection is that you don't find NVIDIA as, as a vice which is foregrounded in those sources, which is curious. My immediate guess is that it's because it is not, you mentioned the connection between virtue and virility in this society. And my suspicion is that you don't find it in sources, Merovingian sources or Carolingian sources where you might expect it to be operating uh, because it's not a, considered a masculine virtue. Hatred is considered a masculine, a masculine vice. Invidia is not. Does that, so are my instincts, what do you think of my instincts on these questions? The quality is not very good. Uh, I, I don't understand the question. Ah, the sound is not good. But, but, why do we not find the the jealousy in the sources Carolingian? Like, um, um, what's the word for vice? I can't think. Uh, uh ma, j'ai le soupçon que c'est pas le c'est ça peut c'est pas un, un, un vertu masculin. Non. No, uh, Nvidia, uh, jealousy is not, uh, I, I don't know if, if it is it's not uh, a male virtue. <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. You think it is, uh, it is connected with women? Yeah. Maybe. Ma, I Mais alors, pour, pour, pourquoi est-ce qu'on trouve dans les sources monastiques, dans les sources ecclésiastiques? Oui. I don't I, I don't think uh Nvidia is uh, is not um it's not a virtue. Uh yeah. is not a virtue. But, but one finds hatred, as you pointed out. One finds and where one where one would expect to find jealousy, invidia, one finds instead in Carolingian sources uh odium, hatred. Is that because Nvidia is feminine and odium is masculine? Well, yes, Nvidia may uh, can cause uh, can cause uh, hatred. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. I don't know. I have to see if my, I think Nvidia. Is to be found in the Carolingian sources. Uh, I, it's a good question, but <laughs> I don't. Um, okay. Nvidia is not a virtue. It's true. No, no, it's a vice. Yes, yes. Nvidia is not. Yeah, a but but odium is a vice also. Is not a virtue. That's what it is. It's not a virtue. Yeah. Courage is a virtue, but mm -hmm. not hatred. Vengeance yeah. is possible. Violence is possible, acceptable. Not all violence is, but mm -hmm. violence is, is acceptable. Vengeance, yes. Hatred, in the sense of vengeance, is acceptable, but. Uh, uh, uh. 
in Libya is not a male virtue. No. Um, yeah. 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 Okay. Thanks. Um, Michael, please. Oh, my God. I'm uh, yes, sorry, I'm there. I'm unmuted, but I can't show my face. I'm sorry. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. good. Um, no, this is interesting. Nvidia, Audion, and I want, wanted to ask about familiaritas. Let me first tell you, I, I brought down stairs only one dictionary, and that's Niermeyer. And that's interesting. It, he doesn't have Nvidia. Um, which is obviously not institutional um, vocabulary, though I'm pretty sure it's monastic vocabulary. Um, he, he doesn't have odium. And what he does have for familiaritas is only stuff that um, has to do with dependency. For example, protection of a monastery afforded by the king. Huh? Mm -hmm. um, uh, the condition, the status of special privileged dependence, and the third item is the ministerialis. Now, familiaritas regime. Um, you had an interesting slide. I think it was was it Cisebeer of Camblou, uh, where there was familiaritas. Uh, yeah. And I thought that um, perhaps there is a kind of familiaritas that is um, that has to do with propinquitas, yeah, yes. with yeah, but also with amicitia. In a way, it's a precondition for amicitia. And how do these three things, amicitia, familiaritas, and the and the blood relationship, how do they um, relate to each other? Here you got it. The habit of familiarity. Is that only the small community? You know, Jeff said, talked about monasteries as, you know, small intimate communities. Is this the, you know, the big aristocratic family? What, what is this familiaritas? Familiarity, familiarity, I think familiarity is a central uh, uh, concept. Uh, for, the, for, the, for the relationships between um, uh, in a uh, disymmetrical uh, relationship uh, for the first place between the king and uh, uh, one of his friends of one of his uh, great yeah. important between the prince, but also inside a community, inside the monastic community. But uh, I think between um, designated persons, not a very broad uh, group. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. Yes. What I say? Yes. Um, it can be. It can be synonymous of. Um, propinquitas, but if there is a real familiarity, what we what we uh, think about familiarity, it it comes from familia, so family, but not the the very large group, uh, the very large family group, uh, the, the 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 little small yeah. community. With religious but, yeah. members. But it is also um, something, as Jeff mentioned, that is people compete for. Huh? People yes. do have competition for getting well, this yes. precious familiaritas so this group can actually broaden. And perhaps it is also connected with education yeah, from young age. Huh? Commendatio, you know, being at the court. So these, I think, these are extremely strong bonds, really strong bonds. Where also, if they go wrong, you might find hatred. 
real odium. And I'm thinking of Vala and Bernard. Huh? That, that, is, that is hatred. Uh, of familiaritas gone wrong. Can you, can you imagine that? Yeah. Oops. Okay, good. Thanks. I'll, I'll get out of here because um, there's a new question. Thank you. Um, next, we have a question from Mark. Thank you for so a brand's impressive presentation. I have one question. Is it possible to observe in the European era of Romanisticism some influence of the ideas of friendship and the hatred of the early middle? I, can you repeat? Is it possible to observe in the European era of Romanticism some influence of the ideas of friendship and hatred of the early middle? Uh, middle Ages, sorry, Middle Ages, sorry. I don't understand. The... Do you, maybe I can help, uh, Mark. Do you mean um, if if um, one can observe the ideas that Professor uh, Lejean have uh, observed in the Middle Ages of uh, hatred and love in the nineteenth century romanticism? Ah, oh. yes, that's what you meant. Yes. Well, I don't know. <laughs> oh. Not no. the nineteenth century romanticism. Yes, that's for another session. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, thank you very much. Please, we kind of oh, run out of time, you. despite more questions. Um, please join me in thanking Professor Lejean once more for a very stimulating um, lecture. Thank you. And what a great way to close the semester. Um, please meet us uh, next semester and the end of March with uh, Helmut Reimert. We'll obviously uh, send you all the invitations. And thank you very much.